Welcome to our show, Tough Talks Unlimited, co-hosted by Derek Bowles and myself, Michael Garland. In this show, we're going to hear from world-class leaders and innovators, people who are willing to have positive conversations and share their insights on tough talks to get you through tough times. Let's get started. Welcome to Tough Talks Unlimited. Myself and Mike Garland are together. And we're excited because we have an unbelievable guest on the show today, a good friend of mine, Thurl Bailey, who I want to give a little bit of history on. You know, people don't realize Thurl had an unbelievable career, played at NC State, um, and then also uh, has done a lot of things in the NBA, uh, 12 years in the league, um, has been a part of really helping the younger generation become better players and better people in the league. And so... I just want to make a quick introduction to Thurl Bailey. How are you doing? It's a blessing to have you, man. Guys, I'm doing great. Blessing to be on your show as well. But uh, life is good, man. Life is really good. I'm blessed. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that, you know, I think is important, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, before we got on the call, you t- talked about your family and things that are that are important to you. And I think this is a great way to start the show because one of the things that popped into my mind is, now you, you're you're a father, but now you're a grandfather. Can you talk about that for a second? Yeah, well, I you know I, I can't even talk about that unless I go back and talk about you know the village raising me back in the day, mm-hmm. being out of D.C. and uh, you know I was fortunate, guys. When, when my parents gave up everything, they they both were in North Carolina in tobacco fields. You mm-hmm. know they were picking tobacco for rich white farmers and not making a lot of money. And uh, it was hard to, to risk it all back then. But my parents, who had already had two, my brother and sister, and I was, my mom was pregnant with me in 1961. They, they just decided that they needed a better life for us. So they moved north to DC and, uh, and I was born in 61. Uh, and, you know, in 61 was like right in the middle of the civil rights era. Right. So, I was fortunate enough to have both parents in the home where most of my friends, you know, some of them had only one and some had neither. The village, the community had to raise them. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I, I really got a good sense of what family and dedication meant and being uh, being present. And so, um, you know, my dad did whatever he could do to to make a dollar and help us survive. And, and right. my mom, you know, my mom was, you know, those women from the South, man, they didn't play. <laughs> you know, we, 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 we didn't act up. You know, we, if we did act up, uh, we got whooped back then. Right. So, <laughs> right. right. Uh, but I think I turned out all right. I, my, I just learned my parents were great teachers, taught me a lot about, you know, being able to, to, uh, to be there for your family and how to mm-hmm. treat people, even even in the civil rights era, even in a tough time, my mom and dad never came home angry after they were out, you know, protesting, and they just came home and taught us what it was all about. So, uh, you know, as a as a dad and a, a grandparent myself, you know, I take all those things. You guys know I take all those lessons and and uh, try to instill them in my kids and hopefully my grandkids, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, without without my parents being there for me and, and my brothers and sisters and getting through what they went through, um, I wouldn't be where I am today, of course. Well, and, and I want to just, you know, ask another question because that that is so powerful what you just said. I want to go back just a little bit because the way that you and I connected was uh, during the NBA D-League uh, mentoring program. And, you know, based on what you just shared, you know, you talked about how your parents really gave you in- information and educated you and prepared you. And now let's kind of shift gears because I think two things pop into my mind. Obviously, the people who are in the NBA now, you have experience, right? You played in the league for 12 years. How, how are you taking that same information that you have and transferring it to that next generation of players? Mm-hmm. Well, we have the information, right? I mean, right. we have it. We've lived through it. Um, sometimes it's not about 
the messenger. It's more about the person who wants to or does not want to receive it. Mm. Right? I mean, it, it's... I, I can't even begin to explain how I, I always draw on the things. You know, sometimes when we were younger, um, we may not here but we're listening right right i mean it may not apply at that point but at some point in our lives when we have to make those choices and they're all aren't going to be good choices so sure. hope the the first thing i tell these young people is don't if somebody thinks you have to be perfect and make every great decision it's not going to happen right right no matter how much information you have it's going to be your choice and all those choices aren't going to be the best ones but um there's always opportunities to learn and to rectify from, you know, the things that, that you've been through, the mistakes you've made. Um, and there's no better teacher, guys. You know that as well as, right. as, as experience. Right. And so what I try to do is keep it real. That's the only way to be, right? You, you can't, if, if, if you're in front of a group of young people, you better have something to say. Uh, you better have, have, you know, been, been through it. Um, because especially as an athlete, mm. uh, there's always a connection there with kids, whether they play sports or not, there's something about sports that, um, I, I don't know. It teaches so many lessons. Absolutely. And if Absolutely. these young people, if, if these young people will, take that information in and then, then when they get to the point where they have to make a decision sometimes those decisions come easier because they have the information about the consequences they have they they get to make the choice um but they don't get to choose the consequences if that choice is not the right one so um you know th that's what we're here for we all the stuff we've gone through all of us um is not meant for us to keep for ourselves. We have to hopefully pass it on to others and, and hope that we affect at least one life. Right. 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 Well, Thurl, <clears throat> I'm going to, I'm going to revisit a uh, time in your life back into the days of the civil rights movement, which was a period of time. I actually um, lived through myself and uh, I'm probably about nine years, your senior, but um <laughs> I remember those times and uh, I have shared this with a lot of young people and uh, sometimes the body language that I get or uh, the lack of response, I, I have to admit it really bothers me because it seems to me that sometimes they don't, they really don't believe what I'm telling them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they 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 don't think um, that those type of atrocities could have happened. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I love to share the story with with people all the time. You know, uh, I remember, you know, for one thing, Daryl, and you you know this, most people think that, you know, the, the March on Spelma or the march on D.C. was the only <laughs> civil rights march going on. There were civil rights marches going on all over the nation, right. in every little town, in every city, in every village, wherever you went, where, you know, there were African-American people, there were marches. And uh, I'm from a little place called Willow Run, Michigan. And uh, we were more or less uh, <laughs> surrounded uh, by our white neighbors and we live right in the middle of them. And during that time, you, we didn't go into their neighborhoods. We, we couldn't like cut across, <clears throat> go down their streets or, you know, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't go anywhere near their homes or be in the same vicinity as them unless you know, we were going to the grocery store or something like that. And I remember my granddad got me dressed. He got dressed and we were going to march up through 
the white folks' neighborhood mm. and on down to the main street and go, it you know, we really didn't have a downtown, just a little area right up where the stores, the drug stores, the gas stations and all that was, and then come back down and around and back into our neighborhood. And I remember being afraid. Mm. And I said to my granddad, I used to call him by his first name. I said, Dave, why are you making me do this? I'm scared. I said, we go up here. These white folks could shoot us and kill us. He said, yeah, I know. And the reason I'm making you do this is to understand that there's things that are worse than death. Mm. And I'm going to teach you how not to be afraid of confronting, you know, when you're not being treated, right. he didn't use the word racism. He said, when you're not being treated right. And uh, I can tell by the sound of your voice and your body language that you understand that, you know, you really understand that, but it, bothers me today when people say uh you know i even talk to my own kids sometimes they don't realize that right now if we give the country up to a certain group i don't know if they'll be able to handle it because we'll be back to overt racism which they've never experienced and they just don't think that that's gonna happen but it could happen mm. And, um, you, you know, I just, man, what you say is so, what you said is so impactful and where you came from to where you are now, but it's frightening that, that, that a lot of young people just don't really, really understand what we're trying to say and the significance of the day we live in to have continued, um, to continued growth for our children and our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. Right, right. We're at a point, in my opinion, where we could lose that. And uh, I guess I say all that because I would love to hear your perspective on what I just said. Well, you know, I when I um, was old enough to understand what was happening. And by the way, you don't look nine years my senior. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, when I was old enough to, to understand what was happening, again, I, I talked about how my, te- my parents were really good at keeping us educated on everything. They, they didn't really hold anything back. Um, and then during that time, desegregation was happening and we were going to... Right. To... Uh, hopefully get better education at white schools we right. bus to white schools. Right. 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 And I tell people who never really, I have to equate it to something. I say, well, if you saw the movie, remember the Titans, mm, that right. was all of our high schools. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so, um, it was very interesting because we, we knew, we understood as kids, but, we also knew that we had to protect ourselves if something went down. Right. Right. Um, but we never, we, we, we never, we were told we, we can't start anything. Right. Right. Don't start it. But if right. something goes down, you got to protect yourself. Right. And you may have to finish it. Um, but it was, it was a different, it was a, a, a kind of a newer generation coming up when I went to Bladensburg, uh, junior high and high school, um, all the noise was outside. But once we got into school, black kids and white kids were finding a way to, you know, to coexist. Right. Um, I became the first black president at Bladensburg High School. Wow. Mm, of the student wow. government there. And that was, you know, it was my high school days were amazing. I, I kind of engulfed myself in sports and school. Uh, my first priority because uh, my mom threatened us as kids that we couldn't come home with C's mm. or below. And, you know, as a kid, you think a C is a passing grade. So what's wrong with that? My mom said, no, I don't raise average kids. So right. you ain't coming home with C's. 
and D's and F's. And so um, my parents were in D.C. when Martin Luther King made that speech. They were right there wow. in the crowd. That's phenomenal. And so um, so we, we knew. We were educated. Uh, and fast forward with that upbringing and being, uh, you know, got through college and then being sent out to Utah. And every time I say Utah to a black person who's not from Utah, um, I, I always get the same thing or any black people out there. So <laughs> when, I, when I first came out to Utah, it was a culture shock. It yes. really was. But what helped me really survive and get through, it wasn't just my basketball. It was my upbringing mm-hmm. because my parents always told me that, look, it comes down to being about people. Mm. and about their heart so you're going to you're going to find racism everywhere you go they told me but um if you find people who are genuine um people who don't see color uh, and they say no matter how, how hard that might be there's people out there that are like that that aren't the same color as you are so right. i was able to survive that just because i was educated and you talk about young people today whenever i get a chance opportunity to speak to any any race, um, I I talk about educating yourself. And now kids today have all these has have technology. They can Google history, and but history is so important, man. Right. It's so important for these kids to understand and learn. And and a lot of them are. You know, I think we have to give right. a lot of them credit because a lot of them are learning. Um, and this generation, I think, hopefully, will be uh, better than the one before it. Uh, but Listen, it, it it racism is never going to go away, right? Um, but I think there's progress that we can make. There's always steps forwards and steps forward and steps backward. But um, it's important. It's important that people like us three are continuing to to carry that message and and to educate these kids, black and white. Right, um, absolutely. And so um, that's. That's why we do all this, right? We're the messengers, and, and we hope that that message is delivered and continues to, to be carried on. Well, you know, <clears throat> um, one, one, one of the things that uh, you brought up about educating, and, um, you know, I, I hear, you know, uh, commentators and different people speak in podcasts and news, um, um, the everyday news, you know, about how, you know, African-American studies is being taken out of schools Mm. and all of that. But then I also hear um, some of our people and some of our people who are saying that, you know, this is a travesty this is a shame, you know, our, our kids can't even learn about themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, when I grew up, there was no African-American history. That history came from home. So that shouldn't be moving us the way it is. And as I talk to D all the time, and I've said this on some radio shows, I think sometimes we're mistaken that removing the education of African-American history is basically on us. When in my opinion, it's not because, and Dee has heard me say this, I believe it's being removed because of the George Floyd effect Mm. and the Barack Obama effect. And what I mean by that, Thorough is this, when you, when people were in those streets marching during the George Floyd situation, the majority of them didn't look like us. They looked like the other people. And that scared a lot of people who just are so much against that. Mm. And I believe that 
powers to be who are against that and said, we got to do something to stop it. Just like what you said when you went started going to school with other white kids, you guys started getting along. Same thing when I went to school, same thing when D went to school. So this, you know, you know, Joe Madison on his show, I don't know if you ever listened to, he always talk about, you know, cultural indoctrination. Mm. And that cultural indoctrination is coming apart. And to do something about it, hey, uh, we won't, we won't, we won't let our kids learn anymore about that. Right. So that was interesting that you said that when you went to school, you know, and once you got guys got inside the school, you know, you guys started, <laughs> you guys started to coexist with one another. And when you look at it and think about it, Barack Obama became president. There's only 13% of us in this country. So right. somebody else had to vote for him. Right. And that's, that's scary to a lot of people. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying, but that responsibility for teaching, you know, for, for our kids uh, understanding who we are and our history, that's up to us. That's up to us. You know, uh, the, the Jews have Hebrew schools. They have them for a reason. Mm. They have them for a reason. Now, they, their kids will still go to school, but they 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 spend time after school going to Hebrew school to learn about them. Yeah. And there's a reason they do that, because they want to teach that. They want to tell that right. story. Right. Well, it's important. It's really important that no matter who you are, good or bad, that you need to know culturally who you are. Yes. Right. You need to know those things and you need to be able to um, talk about those things to whether it's your friends. I mean, when George Floyd was killed, it was really an awakening to a, a generation of people. Absolutely. Right. Um, right. You know, and and it's it's interesting, even out west where I was, people weren't really understanding it totally because mm -hmm. I you know I listen I believe that we live in a really great country and the big the, the best thing about this country is that we have the freedom to be able to express ourselves in, a, in our way so when when the NBA players start taking a knee on the anthem and people were in an uproar you know my my stance was that aren't you glad we live in a country where we can express it has right. nothing to do with us not liking where we are as much absolutely. as it is us not liking what's going on where we are absolutely that's fine so um just having the freedom the ability to be able to talk like we're talking now where you can't do that in other places be able to right. to protest and say look enough is enough only way you're going to hear me is if I do this or do that and, right. and keep it, keeping it nonviolent. So, um, yeah, I mean, at some point, I think we all need to, uh, this world's changing so quickly now. Um, mm. not just the black and white situation, but, right. um, you know, people identifying who they are. I mean, we've got a lot more pronouns now. Sure. Sure. Than exactly. have been. And so it, it's, it's, it's a world that we all have to learn how to coexist and um, the messages don't have to be ones of threatening and violence. Right. Um, but people want to be heard and we live in a place where you have the freedom to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, obviously, and, and this is a powerful conversation, as you know, and uh, one of the things that, that resonates is, you know, we call it Tough Talks Unlimited because we're talking about stuff that nobody really wants to talk about. And, you know, one of the things that I love about you, Thurl, is, you know, I've seen you a number of times um, when I took my son up to Utah to play in the AAU tournament. So we didn't have conversations. Yeah. But I want to shift gears and talk about your time at NC State. Right. 
And I think because I, I want you to kind of because I feel like our conversation right now really is revolving around the separation of our country. And I want to stay on that topic. And I want you to kind of share your experience at NC State, uh, playing for one of the best coaches in the game of basketball, uh, Coach B. And then I also want to know if, if uh, Clay Moser was your assistant at the time. Uh, Clay was not my assistant at the time. Okay, okay. Um, I actually was recruited by uh, Norm Sloan, who was the head coach. They had won. They won the championship with David Thompson in '74. Right. right. Okay. And uh, so I actually was able to, because I didn't start playing basketball, guys, till really my second year of high school. I got cut in junior high. Oh got wow. Cut. I got cut in seventh grade. I was six five. Eighth grade, I was six seven. And uh, the coach told me that he didn't have time to teach me how to play basketball because mm. he wanted to win the championship like that year. So he told me not to come back my, my last year of junior high school. Wow. Uh, for, fortunately for me, he got a job at another school and another coach took over. And uh, so I decided I was going to go try out. I was six nine in ninth grade. Man. And so um, – I tried out for the team, and I wasn't very good. wasn't very good at all. Um, but I made it. Mm. I made the cut sheet, right? You know how you go in and right, want the, right, uh, right. the, the oh, piece yeah. of paper is on the coach's door, and you oh, see yeah. all the names oh, on yeah. there. Uh, so I made the team that year, and um, and the coach called me into his office about four days after I made the team. We had already started practicing, and I was I was probably the worst one on the team, but – uh, I was the tallest. So he sat me down and he said, Thurl, if you want to be a really good basketball, he didn't even say great. He said, if you want to be a good basketball player, you have a lot of work to do. And this is what changed my life. He said, if you want to commit, I'll come in one hour before the team practices, mm -hmm. work with you. And after we practice for two hours, if you want to stay another hour, I'll, I'll come, I'll work with you. Wow. And I couldn't understand. I couldn't understand why a guy who barely knew me would, would decide he wanted to spend that much time with me. And so he told me, he said, son, he said, I see potential in you. I see potential you don't even see in yourself. And if you really want to work hard, if you really want to dedicate yourself, not just on the court, but you got to be coachable at home. You can't be hanging out with people who are going to drag you down. Mm. Cause I, I think you could use this sport to get you places. To... And so I committed, I committed. Um, I started that year. My last year junior high school, every game, I went in for the jump balls, got the first possession. As soon as we got the first possession, he would call the timeout, take me out for the rest of the game. <laughs> <laughs> True story. I averaged 2.3 yeah. seconds in junior high school. <laughs> but I didn't care. I didn't yeah. care. I was excited that I had finally made Absolutely. this this team and you know on the way home on the drive after the game my mom would always look at me and say baby that was a beautiful jump ball you got today can't yeah. wait till next wow. week wow and so I went on and uh kind of came into my own my junior senior year I got offers from a bunch of schools um you know back then if you wanted a kid to go to you, come to your college you recruit them you had to talk to mom exactly right so right. they would come over and my mom would fix them you know dinner Mm -hmm. uh, and Coach Sloan came. North Carolina was recruiting me really hard at one point until they signed James Worthy, so they stopped. And so Lefty Giselle wanted me. John Thompson wanted me because I was local. Mm -hmm. And uh, Norm Sloan came, and we were pretty impressed with him. We knew he was a great basketball coach, uh, but my mom's first question was, Coach, if my son comes to your school, you're going to make sure he gets an education, right? And course coaches would always say, yes, ma'am. And my mom would always follow up. Coach, don't make me come down there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I ended up going to NC State. And uh, after my first season at State, Coach Sloan left and went to Florida. Mm. And you know how it is when you recruit. Right. When, when you give your coach that commitment, it's like a, 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 an extension of your, your parents, right? Absolutely. And so we were in an uproar, man. Guys were, didn't know what to do. I knew what I was going to do. I was going home. 
Oh, wow. So I called my mom, said, Mom, coming home, Coach Sloan, he's taking off going somewhere else, and they haven't hired a new coach yet. And I'm going to quote my mom. She says, son, you ain't coming here. You might be going somewhere, but you ain't coming here. (laughs) (laughs) She said, you're going to stay. You're going to get your education. That's what you went there for. And you're going to wait it out to see who they hire. So they go and hire some guy from a school I never heard of. I own a college. (laughs) And the guy named Jim Balvano, he walks in the room all confident. We didn't know him. We, I think our arms were crossed. We were looking down at the floor because we didn't really want to hear it. We didn't know this guy. We didn't right. trust him. Right. And so he's coming in trying to take over. And the first thing he says when he looks up at us to introduce himself, he said, guys, first of all, I know you don't want to be here. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to talk to you for about 25 minutes. And if I'm when I'm done, if you guys, you still want to leave, I'll sign your release forms. I mean, he was about to risk losing his whole team. Mm-hmm. And then he said, I know, I'm quoting him now, I know I'm going to win a national championship soon. That's what he said. Mm. So um, he proceeded for about 20 minutes to sell it to us. And the more he spoke, the more we kind of set up because it sounded pretty good what he was was selling us, right? Absolutely. (laughs) And he said, there won't be a day that goes by. I won't remind you of the ultimate goal our ultimate goal is to win a national championship there's a lot of stuff in between we got to do to get there but our ultimate goal is to win one and we're going to do it so by the time he was done we were all hyped nobody left and uh that was our introduction coach valvano wow mm. Mm. wow mm. i want to i want to say something because i think we're wis- witnessing it again with Deion Sanders, what he's doing at Colorado in football. And and I think one of the things that, that Deion has done is he spoke it into existence. It's similar to what Coach uh, Valvano did as well. He spoke that they were going to win a national title, and you guys executed that. And so I think there's something to be said about really believing before you see it. I mean, you got to have it in your stomach. You got to have it in your gut. You got to carry it with you. And if you believe it, it's going to happen. And the reason why I say that, because I know there's certain things that I believe about myself and I believe it. And I think other people need to have that same type of strength to make that happen. Hey, he took it a step further. Mm. In one of our practices, there was a, he used to have a pair of gold scissors he kept on his desk all the time. And so he came in late for practice one time and brought a ladder with him. He put that ladder under the hoop (laughs) and he had a stack of nets. And he said, guys, for the next two hours, all we're going to do for practice is we're going to practice cutting the nets down. Wow. Wow. And and he said, uh, and we didn't understand at first. He said, yeah, Thor, you're going to go up first. All you guys will follow. I'm going to go up last. I'm going to cut the net down, put it around my neck. And you guys are going to pick me up and carry me around this empty arena like you just won the national championship. Mm, and it was the most awkward thing we <laughs> ever done. I mean, how do you do that? Right. And he said, listen, guys, if if we want to be great, we want to win a national championship, we got, we got to be different. Mm. We got to get outside our comfort zone. And he said, I want you to visualize when we win a national championship, what you would do when that happened. And I want you to do those same things right here. What's your first thing you do? How would you carry yourself? What do you see in your mind that wow. you, how you, how would you celebrate? Wow. Right. And so we did that like twice a month. And about the fifth time, I think we were really into it. We were throwing coach up and down, <laughs> up in the air. We were running up and down the stairs. There were a couple of guys climbing on top of baskets. Um, and so, uh, it, it, it it was amazing that he got us to visualize what it would look and feel like right. if we did it. Right. And, you know, I, I, I have to cap that story off by saying when we beat the number one team in the country by Slamma Jamma, Houston Cougars with Olajuwon and Drexler. Right. When that shot went down and the place went crazy, um, the NCAA guy comes over with, the box with the scissors in it 
and Coach V stops him in his tracks. And he reaches inside of his coat pocket mm. and, pulls, and pulls out those gold scissors that Are he practiced. Are you serious? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This man was a visionary, I'm telling you. And, yep. and you know, we can't believe it unless he really does. And so he was an expert. The guy was just amazing at helping us understand individually first what we needed to bring to the table and then collectively um, how to, how to, I mean, we had to be good. You can't be a bad team and win a national championship. So we had players. We knew that. Right. Um, on a given night, we might get beat by 20, but we, we learned from it. We moved on. But by the time we got to the ACC tournament, we went through uh, Wake Forest, Ralph Sampson in Virginia, Michael Jordan in North Carolina, because we would not have made the NCAA right. tournament that year right. Right. if we had not won the ACC tournament. Right. Wow. Right. Wow. We had a 16 and 10 record going into the ACC tournament. Right. But we won the tournament, got an automatic bid. and um, But that final game was – it just – capped it off when B took out those scissors and cut the nets down and like wow. holy cow, this dude was crazy good. But you know, it, it's interesting you talk about that journey and uh, I myself, I was on the staff when we won the 2000 National Championship and uh, we had Mateen Cleves but mm -hmm. our our journey was a little different than yours. We had a we had actually had a pretty good season um, but um, we had lost Mo for about half that season. So we got him back without him really being 100% right at tournament time. So we had to figure out, you know, or better, better put, he had to figure out how he could, you know, best, you know, um, contribute to the team when he wasn't a hundred percent physically. Yeah. And he went right to that leadership piece mm. and he took that and raised the level of his leadership. Um, I mean, it was incredible what he was doing, but uh, you know, if anybody has never read that story about you guys, journey to get to the, the national championship game and, and win it they should read that that wow. is i have read it maybe three four times you know it talk about and 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 we have been there early on in in tom's career we have been there where you know you're the lower c you get the worst hotels and <laughs> the whole thing i think part of it talks about you guys stayed in a hotel that was basically a hotel for lovers and there was mirrors on, <laughs> on the ceiling and all the whole yeah. night, man. And, uh, you know, you guys had some very tough games along the way. And as we did too, because when you win it, you know, you, you've got to win those kind of games in order to, to, to get to that Monday night and actually take that title. But yeah, boy, you guys, you, 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 you have a phenomenal story and, what happened to you and how that, um, you know, how it actually came out. You know, one thing I always wanted to ask someone from your team, and I know Derek Wittenberg very well. Um, it was a shot. It was, was it? Ball. <laughs> you knew what I was going to say. <laughs> but you don't, know what? Don't, don't ever talk to Derek about that. He'll always tell you it was a pass. <laughs> <laughs> the day he dies, it was an air ball. Derek never passed. <laughs> it wasn't his job. No, no, it wasn't his job. But you know, thorough. But from that, people turned it into an actual play. Right. Yeah. People turned that into a play. That's right. And it would get people. I mean, it, it would until people started to understand what people were doing, you know, it, it would it would get right. you. Right. So That's you right. had to scout that. But <laughs> so from Thurl Bailey, I'm finally found out it was actually <laughs> Derek. <laughs> he was shooting the shot, not making that pass. To you. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, <laughs> funny. Well, I want to say this, and, and we're, we're going to uh, 
uh, transition because we, we, we appreciate your time more than anything. But um, tell us about what you got going on. I really want you to give us a little bit of background so people who are watching the show can engage and then make sure you provide us information so we can post your website and all those good things. So tell us what's what's really going on with you, Thurl. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a guy who never really sets, can really set still. Um, I have my main job. I work for the, I've been working for the jazz as a broadcaster for the last 24 years. Mm. I transitioned from the court to the, to mic, to the mic, uh, which is what I studied at NC state communications, wow. TV, radio. Mm. And, uh, I enjoy my job. I enjoy talking about the game and enjoy uh, kind of interpreting the game to the listener and what's going on. So it keeps me close to the game. Uh, it keeps me close to the players and getting to know them. And and it's been nice to see how the players respect and understand where I've been. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, sometimes you get a young player who it's all about them and they haven't, they don't, they don't know anything about the past. It's just about right. uh, them going forward. But it's it's been, been a really nice transition. I have a great team that I work with with the Jazz. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've got a new owner for the Jazz, Ryan Smith, who's doing some amazing things. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. We've gone from a 30% a viewing audience to basically 100%, because if you got oh, an wow. antenna now, if you got an antenna and you're within range, you can get every single jazz game for free. Wow. And so that's groundbreaking. No other team in the NBA has done that, but I believe there will be a lot that will follow suit. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, it's very smart. That's and, smart. Uh, you know, it's not as lucrative financially, but Absolutely. I think they're going to make up for it. Right. In, you know, in other ways, in sure. marketing the team. Right. Uh, of course, I wrote a book. I'm an author now. Uh, team of Destiny is my book. And, what I did as we talked about that championship, what I did was uh, I knew that every journey has a story, right? There's something that there's something that brought us all to that one place at NC State. So I wanted to know what happened before my teammates got there. A lot of things I didn't know. And so I went back and I interviewed each player and each person who was responsible for us, us being there, who was still around to talk about their life, their journey before NC State and got some amazing stories. Mm -hmm. um, one of our guys, Ernie Myers, who uh, stepped up when our our best, one of our best players, Derek Wittenberg, went down. Ernie Myers stepped up as a freshman and just became one of the best freshmen of the year that year. Um but what what we didn't know was that his parents were in prison. Oh, mm. wow. Yeah. His mom and his stepdad uh, were locked up for uh, drug dealing. Mm. And nobody knew that but Coach Valvano and the coaches. And that story is important because I'm not sure there are a lot of coaches that would take a chance on a kid mm -hmm. who came from that environment. Exactly. And so Coach V did. He saw something in and Ernie and, and uh, you know, signed him to a letter of intent. And Ernie became a crucial part of, of, why, of why we won that national championship. Wow. So wow. every story goes through the, the journey of those people who were important um, in, in helping create that national championship team. Uh, and other than that, I, I travel around. I do a lot of speaking engagements for corporate and youth. Uh, use that platform. Um, I and I also teach athletes how to find their story. You know, how do you, how do you, uh, as an athlete, because people need to hear what you've gone through, and so a lot of past a athletes, present, they don't know how to capture that story, and so I I put it in a simple way that they that they can pull those things out of themselves and use it, whether to find speaking engagements, to write a book, to, or have something for their posterity. But people need to know about that journey because there are a lot of people out there wondering 
you know, how can I get through this? Well, if, if, if you go back and, and, and read my story or you guys' sure. story, sure. That they will, they can understand that all stories are kind of based on the discovery. Discovery is, uh, the part of your story that um, actually the call is the first part. Something called you into wanting to do like you, Derek, something called you into wanting to do a podcast. What was, what called you into it? Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's the pit. The pit moment is the very deepest, toughest part of our lives that sometimes we don't want to talk about the failure, the hurt, the pain. Sure. Mm-hmm. sure. It's just like it says, it's the pit. You're in this, you're in this hole and it's, it's a painful hole and a lot of us will stay in it. But then comes uh, the search. Most of us will search. How do we, how, who do we ask questions to? And you know, my parents just say, ask the right questions to the right people. Um, and so mm-hmm. after you search, if you search long enough, you make a discovery of things that, you know, you didn't know about prior. And then you can go on and, and hopefully be successful in other things. So I help. Um, athletes in particular That's good. find stories and, That's and good. craft them in a way that they can use them. So, and I'm, you know, I'm a dad. I've got a son playing in Germany. Mm. Okay. Uh, in the top league over there. I've got a son serving a two year church mission in New York right now. Okay. He's, he decided that uh, it wasn't about him. He wanted to go do the Lord's work mm. and, ser- and, and serve people. And then I have a daughter who's killing it in the, tech world in utah and I'm, I'm out here visiting my son right now as we record this just had a a new baby so i'm on my third grandchild um and life is good man now did i hear you say you're in cleveland right now i am in cleveland yeah my son my my youngest son is there with his daughter oh okay right there right right yeah. there, on the west side of cleveland yeah yeah I have an ex teammate here too, Sydney Lowe, who's, mm-hmm. who's uh, working with the Cavs. So, yeah. yeah. Um, life is good, brothers. Life is good. That's no, good, no, man. no question. No question. And it's people like you that make it even better. And, uh, well, I appreciate really- what you guys are doing. You guys are getting that word out and you're teaching people. And, and uh, I'm honored to be able to, to be on your show and share my journey. Well, you know, um, <clears throat> we're going to, we're going to, even though, like Derek said, it's tough talks, but um, basketball season's coming up and we're all basketball people. We're going to pick that aspect of, of the podcast up a little more. And, you know, we, we if if you don't mind, we'd love to have you back on to talk about the jazz, the NBA, Absolutely. basketball. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, we just love to have you. And, uh, you know, once again, if you could give our audience the name of your book and uh, where they would actually be able to go to to yep. um, buy it. Well, it's called Team of Destiny. Uh, that's what they were calling us back then. Right. And uh, it opens up with uh, part of my journey. And I've got some really good people that have, that have uh, endorsed it. Uh, Mike Krzyzewski. Mm. has uh, a quote in there and um, there's a bunch of great coaches that have uh, Jim Nance who actually Jim Nance was in the stands he went to University of Houston okay okay he was going to school there he was in the stands sitting right behind Brent Musburger and of course he wanted Houston to win Uh, (laughs) but uh, it wasn't to be Right. So they can find it on uh, Amazon. They go to Amazon and put in Team of Destiny and, and mm-hmm. find it there. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was it, it was uh, something that I, I, I felt like I, I needed to do. And, and it wasn't so much for me as it was for each of my teammates and all of those responsible. Because I think people know about the, the dunk by Lorenzo Charles. They know about Coach Volvano running around looking for somebody to hug. <laughs> right. But they, they didn't know who Tommy DiNardo was, right? And if I say Tommy DiNardo, people say, well, who was that? I don't remember him playing. He never got in the game. Right. But he came to every practice on time and, and made me better. Absolutely. Right. And he, and he was a walk-on. 
Right. So his story needs to be told because there, right. there are thousands and thousands of kids who walk on and may not get a minute in the game, but they come to every practice and they, they give their all and they go on to be successful in their lives. And so right. I just felt like those stories needed to be heard. Um, it was even an eye-opening book for Jim Balvano's wife, Pam Balvano, because a lot of those stories Coach V never brought home with him. You know, he never brought his work home, so she didn't yeah. know some of the things that were going on, right? you know, in the team's life. So i um, very blessed to be able to write that book. And, uh, again, Amazon.com, they can go okay. find it. Okay. Well, Thurl, we appreciate you, man. It's been a blessing. We look forward to staying connected. And like Coach said, we'll get back when the, the basketball season rolls around. And uh, enjoy your time in Cleveland. I will. It's upon us, man. So, yeah, hit me up. I'm, I'm, I can talk about basketball all day long. So, uh, <laughs> it's an honor, Thurl. Thank you, guys. Yes. All right. Welcome to our show, Tough Talks Unlimited, co-hosted by Derek Bowles and myself, Michael Garland. In this show, we're going to hear from world-class leaders and innovators, people who are willing to have positive conversations and share their insights on tough talks to get you through tough times. Let's get started.